Now, does that, um, how much does that change things going forward? To some extent, liquidity is like oil in the engine. When you run out of oil, the engine stops, but going from four quarts to five quarts doesn't necessarily mean that the engine goes any faster. Um, so mm -hmm. we're, we're gonna be studying the crisis, the, the crash, and, and all those uh, liquidities and interconnections for, for a generation, um, but I don't know that it, it actually changes things enormously. Now, having said that, I'm ready for the rest of you guys to jump <laughs> yeah, in and totally. say yeah, I mean, wrong. that sounds like the fundamental like, economics aren't questioned, but the mechanics of the system. Well, we, we yeah. saw something that we hadn't seen in 40, 50 yeah. years and didn't think we were going to see again, but it's a phenomenon. A run on a bank is something that we kind of understood. It, you don't need a brand new theory of runs on the bank. You just need to apply it to a different kind of asset. But, but this, is, this is where the investments people who are on that side and the corporate finance people, you know, Raghu and I, not Cliff, Cliff, <laughs> Cliff, you, sh you should have been in the middle, um, you know, are very different because in corporate finance, we've had models like this for th at least 30 years. Doug Diamond, who's on our faculty, wrote a very famous paper in the early 80s on bank run. Oh, and, and so, and so, but you know, in the sense that that was, you know, you asked, did we learn anything um, that we didn't know? I think bank runs, you know, are in the literature. People understand they happen, and they don't happen often. Well, we just had a not often occurrence. Um, the second thing that you get out of corporate finance is that it's real important to look at who has an incentive to do what to whom, and here a lot of the securities people had no incentive for the security to be good because they had no skin in the game and they sold it off. Well, that's where a lot of the mischief came in. And I think what was a surprise is how much of that was going on. It wasn't so much of a surprise that it happened once you see after the fact what happened. Well, and, I'm sorry. I was just going to reiterate yeah, totally. what, uh, a couple of things that John said uh, related a little bit to Steve is I think one of the things we, we didn't understand is just how interconnected everything was, uh, particularly on the institutional side. Something that, that we people have talked about in models, like, like Steve mentioned, that institutions can matter, um, but I don't think we, we understood the extent to which they were doing lots of similar things. Um, the, the, the correlation in trade, some of, some of the... Um, the networking uh, connectedness of, of, of how these institutions behave uh, in a crisis in particular, I think becomes very correlated. And the other thing I'd add to that is, is liquidity. Liquidity we've, we've thought about for a long time, but no one knows how to measure until after the fact. So I think you know, a, lot of, a lot of what's gonna happen, I think, for the future, and we'll probably touch on this later, is uh, a great deal of research uh, trying to understand when we're headed for uh, liquidity dry ups or credit crunches, whatever you wanna call them, um, and what can indicate those things. But we often never see them until it's, until it's too late. To, to bridge the gap, I think it is important to talk about the corporate finance versus the investment side because we're implicitly talking about both. And, and Steve's right to, to, to push on John's point about the corporate side and uh, we've certainly studied it and, 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 and maybe the, the events that, uh, that have happened say we should keep studying it uh, without a doubt. But the investment side, one thing that's kind of fascinating with the exception of the securities that were most directly exposed to these exact uh, corporate finance effects to the weird structures. Um, the results from markets, and this is something uh, Fom and French blogged about this. I, I, it's not unknown, but I think it's not broadly known that the results for broad market stocks, bonds, regular asset classes were really, really bad, but not really, really exceptionally, we can't believe this, this disputes theory bad. Um, so seeing a very bad result, there, there's a kind of narrative bias to want to go back and figure out exactly went wrong, what went wrong. And plenty of things went wrong, and it all had to do with what we're getting at, uh, which is all the linkages and whatnot and how things are financed. But in terms of raw res investment results, stock market returns, bond market returns, it was, I think it was less crazy than advertised on that spectrum. Doesn't mean we weren't close to the abyss on some other spectrum. We haven't, we haven't begun to disagree. <laughs> I know, that's very frustrating. I asked them to disagree. No, because, yeah, yeah. Now, do you mean that if we're not going to, or is this an Admiral Nelson, we have not yet begun to disagree? I, think, I think, well, Lord Cochrane. Um, <laughs> so Ron, far, oh, this is a con well, very conservative, Paul, where we're saying the, the theory is there, it's on the shelf, Farragut. and what we learned is that it can apply in oh, ways we hadn't before. thought. But, but Steve, you know, I, I, I know about Doug Diamond's papers, too, where, you know, where they're all sitting on the shelf, and 
we're applying fairly standard theory to understand this thing. This is not an event that says, oh, we have to throw out the theory or even the empirical book. What we now, learn is to apply it. Now, Raghu, well, you have to, will have I, it. I was going to say, uh, you know, to be fair, uh, just to, uh, integrating what both of you have said, I think we did put it on a shelf and say, said it belongs on a shelf. Uh, Doug Diamond talks about when he gave his job market seminars on his seminal uh, bank run paper, and people used to say, why are you talking about economic history here? <laughs> so uh, the point is people thought that in developed countries, the idea of a pure panic, the idea of bank runs, the idea of a liquidity event of the kind we saw was really, by and large, history. We wouldn't have to worry about it. And I think what we've learned is you can't take the plumbing for granted. Uh, macroeconomics, we've done macroeconomics without a bank, without an institution in the model, uh, without even thinking about you know, debt, who owns it, who, who has lent to it. It was a very useful simplification for a long time. It worked very well, and we could ignore the plumbing. I think what we've recognized is that when you ignore the plumbing too much, it backs up. And then it, uh, you, you smell it. Uh, it's, it it's you a problem. You committed to that analogy, yeah. right? <laughs> now, Just, now in, let me add what, one last point. Um, we also right. learned a lot about the government and how the government behaves and what it's likely to do in a crisis and how it's likely to bail everybody out, no matter what it says. I mean, the, the policy response was was genuinely new. That's not economics in, or finance. In, in terms <laughs> of the one thing that completely surprised me, which I didn't know before, uh, was this this notion of a pure panic, where, uh, you know, for a moment, even arbitrage relationships with, which we think should hold, stopped holding. I mean, covered interest parity for a little while went out of the window. That, to my mind, was a surprise, that people could get so scared and want to hold money so dearly that they wouldn't take advantage of money that seemed to be lying on the table and just pick it up, the old... Uh, well, let me speak as someone who was supposed to pick that up. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the, and, and to some extent we did. Uh, we maintained some of those positions, we increased some of them. But when you're, when you're faced with, it, with counterparties where you're literally not sure they will be there in, in the next two weeks, when they can, in the, in, 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 in the reverse, when they can pull your financing. Um, I like to talk about when you and your client are doing an unlevered trade, there are two people who can panic. When, as soon as you borrow a nickel, there are now three people who can panic, and the banker is the, is the stupidest investor of the three. Um, with almost, it's not even, it's even unfair. They're the investor who doesn't get the upside. Um, so they, they're clearly the most conservative investor of the three. So when you are facing these things, um, in particular, my firm trades in convertible arbitrage, which is never a perfect arbitrage, but got to levels where um, it was, if the world survives, if we're not eating canned goods, these things have to come come back, yet there was a very good chance that there would be no banks that would finance your position. And then you'd be forced to liquidate an even larger position if you added to that when everyone was liquidating it. So I'm not solving it, I'm getting back to the plumbing problems. But I, I, I'm just saying, the, uh, I'm defending the poor arbitrageur, not that anyone feels bad for them, um, but it was not so easy. The limits to arbitrage are very, very real. Um, and slow-moving capital kind of, uh, kind of assertions are, are very real. And we, you know, this actually argues we had a literature on this, and then we just lived it. And, and maybe we didn't pay enough attention, but to, to all your points, we did not have this, this, this literature. We, we maybe big, understated its importance. We had a big literature on five basis points that became 5%. Yeah. And, and in order to pick up that $20 bill on Lever the 30 to you, one. you had to borrow, yeah. and that's why you couldn't pick it up. Yeah. Yeah. But well, some things, you know, when it actually, I, I, this is a theory of mine, but I actually, I, 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 well, like all my theories, I think it's accurate. Um, <laughs> I think the, the bleeding finally stopped when a bunch of these trades got attractive on an unlevered basis. Yep. I mean, this is something I haven't even read about, but we experienced at our, at our firm. Uh, and again, some of the arbitrage merger, convertible arbitrage, what we trade most closely, but they got so wide that you didn't have to borrow a nickel. If you put on a dollar, of the trade without borrowing a dollar. You were very happy with the, with the returns. And I don't know if there's ever nat a natural stopping point. There might never be something, and there could be a panic that blows that away. But that seems like a very strong break wall before things can go further. If when you get to the point where the trade is incredibly attractive without having to borrow a nickel, which by the way, you have to go through a lot of pain. <laughs> I'm not downplaying getting to that. But it is interesting to me that from my kind of casual observation, that's where a lot and it could be coincidence, maybe the government, you know, I tend not to be a big government guy, but 
Maybe they stepped in at that point, I don't know. But I, I believe that was very important. I think that was a natural point where it was very hard to get worse than that. So there's a lesson and a puzzle. Why does our financial system, especially for handling fairly complex securities, require so much debt? So the next thing I wanted to ask is, is to the question. <laughs> yeah, is a good, that was not a question I have. I'm the to moderator. <laughs> we're, we're happy to interrupt because we don't know. We don't, yeah, yeah, we'll get to that later. Yeah. So when I think about the late 1970s, something happened that a lot of people uh, on the coasts didn't know could happen. A lot of people in Hyde Park did know could happen and had a theory. And then that theory became very useful, the, the, the Hyde Park theory. Um, a, uh, on the coasts. What, what is on your bookshelves or in your brains that, that we don't know that will help us now? Can, can you guys tell us some of the theoretical work of the last decade, of the last two decades, um, that, that's particularly useful to explain the, this next period? And, and Raghu, I feel like you've gotten a lot of credit for seeing a lot of the dynamics uh, uh, of this crisis long before um, almost anyone else did. So I guess that makes you the unlucky first. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, look, um, I mean, there are so many exciting things happening in, uh, in finance now, uh, and uh, it, it's hard to know where, where to start. Clearly, this crisis will prompt an enormous amount of research, and we'll try and figure out, uh, you know, all the things, things we didn't know. I mean, just to mention a few, uh, clearly, issues of corporate governance uh, become very important in thinking about this crisis. We, you know, a lot of people say the problems arose, everybody has their favorite cause, but one cause is you had these investment banks which were partnerships, which moved towards public limited companies and then went into the leverage that, uh, that John is talking about. So some people, you know, pinpoint the instability in the financial system to that. Well, trying to understand what's the difference between a partnership and a public limited company? What are the governance differences, et cetera, et cetera? I think that's a very interesting avenue for research, and there's a lot of that uh, uh, coming, uh, coming out. So that's one set of issues. Take John's question right now, which is, what does leverage have to do with all this? Why do we lever up to the point where we're so fragile? And, you know, uh, the, the theory that Doug Diamond and I have been putting out is it's part of the process of raising money. You know, everybody here has been brought up on Modigliani Miller, and uh, if you remember, the big question in corporate finance classes is why does Modigliani Miller not hold? Because otherwise we'll be out of a job. We won't, uh, there's no point in talking about capital structure if the Modigliani Miller theorem holds. Well, the, the argument that some of us have been making is there's a difference uh, between equity and debt. Debt offers you more discipline, but short-term debt is especially disciplinary. So if you remember your classes back then, uh, there was supposed to be a tax advantage due to debt. Well, if there's a tax advantage due to debt, it doesn't matter whether you borrow long-term or short-term, you still get the tax advantage. Why did these guys borrow so short-term, overnight stuff, and lever up to, to, to the hilt? The, the answer we try and give is it has to be that somehow the investors, the people who lend to them, are far more confident when it is so short term, especially if it's secured. They're willing to go a long way uh, lending to you uh, with, with, uh, with, uh, with, with that kind of, uh, of ability to, to withdraw and run at will. And this then is a very efficient form of financing most of the time. It works most of the time. It becomes problematic when there's a system-wide panic. And that's sort of what brought the system down. So uh, why leverage? Well, leverage is cheap. Not just for tax reasons, but if you lever up short term, it's particularly cheap. You shave basis points. And you have the incentive to do this a lot, mm. especially when money is plentiful, especially when returns are hard to come by. You gotta squeeze every basis point for what you can get, and that's why we get more leverage. But the, um, I, 